Hi everyone, how's it going? Tim here and this is part 11 of the course on building products with JavaScript. Uh, so we're finally here. This is part 11 deployment. It's the final part in the course, but that doesn't mean uh, we're uh, done with those videos. You know this. Um, there's going to be another video which will conclude the course and where I will ask you to help me with um, picking the next topics. But you know, I will talk about that at the end of this video. So let's get to the deployment part, the fun part. So what I did on the last live stream was I uh, first of all prepared the client for um, deployment, right? So the thing is, we had a client which was not optimized and had a bunch of like the JavaScript was like, what, five megabytes of size or something along those lines. So, you know, I don't really want to deploy like this. And there was the hot reloading injection and all that kind of stuff. So I had to obviously optimize it. So first of all, uh, what I did is I uh, changed. So basically, I checked the production by uh, node environment. And if uh, node environment is set to production, I actually consider applying the plugins. So you can see here now the um, hot reloading and emit errors only applied when it is not in production. Same goes for the uh, middleware injection. And if we're running production, I extract the CSS into a separate file because you know, that's kind of browsers are better at parsing in this way. Uh, and I also inject a bunch of optimization modules. So uh, or plugins, I guess, uh, first one is this loader options plugin, which um, um, is one of the default webpack plugins that's recommended to uh, inject then the uglify as well. So those are default ones. And then the custom one is the uh, Lodash module replacement plugin. It's a very nice um, plugin, which uh, we can just quickly Google here uh, from the uh, creator of Lodash uh, that helps you make a smaller builds with Lodash. So the idea is that it looks for the um, I don't I don't know if they explain it here anywhere. Um, pam, pam, pam. No, it doesn't. Uh, okay, yeah, so it doesn't seem to be uh, but basically the idea is that they look for the um, Lodash that you yeah, there you go. This looks better. So basically, this is what it does. If you import the Lodash and then uh, use only one method from it, what it does, it will uh, convert those imports into the imports of specific files that only import this specific function and apply that function, which decreases the build significantly. And it will be even better once the Lodash 5 uh, with modular build is released. So this is, you know, a great optimization, it actually cut down like few hundred kilobytes, which is always nice. All right. So then the compiler, again, if we are not in production, we're still using the same middleware. If we are in production, we just compile statically to the uh, JavaScript files. That's it. Done. So this is the client optimization. I believe I didn't really do anything else here. Oh, yeah, there was another thing. Um, so uh, because in initial version, we actually had, um, let me think, um, no action types. Wait a second. Yeah, in, 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 no, not here. In Epics, right? There we go. Authentication, for example. So here, before we had the backend hard coded to localhost, which obviously won't work when we want to deploy it to any URI really that is out there. Yeah. So what I did is I allowed overriding it using the API host, which is, as you can see over here, injected using the defined plugin. So here's our API host and it defaults to localhost 8080 so that it doesn't break any old build, you know, when you don't really specify it. Um, that that's basically it for the client code. So there's not that much changes actually, um, just again, webpack config mostly and uh, some tweaks to API handling. Um, Right. So the next thing is Docker file. Um, as you know, you know, we need a Docker container to deploy it. And this is how because this is how we're doing it right now. And uh, this Docker file um, uses this uh, custom um, node yarn Docker file because uh, let me open it. So because the, the thing is that we, we are using yarn. So you know, it's only uh, reasonable to use Docker image that has yarn in the base and default node uses NPM. So this one, uh, what it does is pretty straightforward. Um, this is actually seems to be wait, what? It's now again to npm install global yarn. Um, that seems a bit weird, I think. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so this is the outdated. It picks up Docker file one of the old. So basically, the idea is that yarn uh, from one of the latest versions is no longer installed using npm, it is now have to be installed natively. So uh, what this 
Docker image does is basically uh, inherits from the latest node version. And as you can see, I contributed this 7.6 um, image here, which was trivial really, but hey. Uh, and then it just runs the apt-get install to actually install the yarn using the um, apt-get again, because this is Debian based image. So you have yarn natively and it works perfectly well and it's actually like twice as fast as NPM. So that's all good. Um, again, typical setup, create folder, copy our package and yarn log, then run yarn to install dependencies and cache them, then copy app and expose port 3000 to um, actually, you know, allow linking it to whatever we need. And npm start is our default command. So nothing, no, no magic here, right? Right. So the next step is GitLab CI. So we want to uh, build, test and release our client now. So as you can see here, I've added the uh, build clients, test clients, and release client steps, uh, and they all uh, are part of the same stage as the server, build server, test server, and release server. So the way it looks now in the pipelines is actually this. Um, as you can see here, we now have two tasks per um, step, and they won't be executed, the next step won't be executed unless those both of them pass as far as I remember. So. Again, uh, building is stupid, it's just Docker build, so nothing magical here. Testing is uh, straightforward as well. So one thing I want to note is that I had to set the time zone here to Berlin because the snapshots uh, in the client are generated in my time zone in, in Euro Berlin. So other, if you want to set it, then the time inside of the Docker container will, time zone inside of the Docker container will be different and it won't match the snapshot in the end because we're using dates in some places there. So I had to do that. Uh, and then releases the exactly the same. So just take the client image and push it as a release image. Uh, right. And then the final thing is uh, deploy step. So before we go into this, I want to talk a bit about the setup. So I've uh, done this on uh, my own server. So I have this like small um, demo server that hosts my demos and as well my website. Uh, it's, it's just a bare bones server, which is a very simple um, and here's the setup. So as you can see here, there's a bunch of things running on it right now. But the core things that is interesting for us is this um, JVilder Nginx proxy and JRCS Let's Encrypt and Nginx proxy companion. So um, first of all, let's see um, Nginx proxy. So the idea is this uh, container provides you an automated Nginx proxy for Docker containers using the Docker gen, which uh, is a very easy way to set up Nginx. But you know, if you want a more complicated setup, you can actually take this Docker gen thing and uh, create a custom setup yourself. But I won't go into details right now. So the idea with Nginx is really simple. You run it as a um, uh, primary entry point on port 80, as you can see here, and you link it to your Docker socket for read only, obviously. Um, and then once you run a container, all you have to do to root to it so that Nginx will pick up the, its host and so on and you know create the config for it, you have to just pass the virtual host variable and say, hey, this website should live on this host. So for example, um, I don't really need to switch the screen. So for example, we have my um, codezen.net website, which is my personal website, which is, you know, very simple. So if I do docker inspect um, code Zen, uh, we can actually see here that all I did so it's a it's a basic Nginx container, it's a static uh, website. So all I needed to run it actually, um, where's the environment variables, there we go. So all I needed to run it is say, hey, host is codezen.net concept codezen.ru, right? That that's all I need. That's n everything else is set up automatically completely. I don't even care about how it's done. So um, the cool thing is that it will, uh, you don't even need to use the ports or, you know, anything, expose the ports or anything. It's all will be inside of the container and the Nginx proxy will automatically figure out which port to use. Um, alternatively, if you have like many ports exposed, sometimes obviously container might do this. Uh, there are ways to say that basically, um, where was it? Um, da, 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 let me open the companion here. Virtual host, I think it was something like a virtual port so that you can specify actually the uh, port C for virtual host configs. Um, wait, I am missing it, obviously. Uh, multiple ports, yeah, there you go, virtual port. So if you set it, then it will use this specific port, um, whatever you like. 
Okay, so the next thing is that if you note it, again, my website is an example, it's secure, so it's running behind HTTPS with the certificate provided by Let's Encrypt because, you know, it's, it's easy to set up, so why the hell would I not run HTTPS website? Um, the way it's done is there is this um, um, Docker Let's Encrypt Nginx Proxy Companion, which is an additional container that you run uh, alongside the um, uh, Nginx proxy. So as you can see here, I have it over here. So, and it's um, run by um, Docker Compose, but that's a different story. Uh, so the idea is that you run this container and link it to the more or less the same path as your um, Nginx proxy. So it complicates the launch of the Nginx proxy a bit because you not only have to link the sockets, but you also have to create the volumes for uh, HTML because the Nginx needs some validation and you need the volume for configs and for certificates, obviously. So then you start the Let's Encrypt companion, which again takes the same socket, uses volumes from Nginx proxy that you created before and writes certificates to the same folder uh, where you know this one just reads it from them, the Nginx proxy and the uh, companion should write the certificates there. So that, that's actually all you need to do to set up the uh, Nginx uh, and Let's Encrypt with Docker, like literally. And then once you run the website, all you actually have to do is provide Let's Encrypt host and Let's Encrypt email, which will be used to generate the Let's Encrypt certificates. Once again, if we look at the uh, my code then, um, thing you can see that there is multiple hosts, so codezen.net, codezen.ru, and here's my Let's Encrypt email, which is my private email at codezen.ru. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so yeah, you know that that's literally all you have to do to get an HTTPS encrypted website behind the Docker. Um, this is the server side setup, and uh, yeah, okay, I have my images open, which we don't really need, um, and uh, this brings us to the deploy task in CI. So um, the way it's done here is a bit naive, let's call it this way. So uh, the because we're using the shared runners on GitLab, I had to actually gen generate a new private SSH key, allow it on my server and put this SSH key into GitLab. Um, why I'm saying that this is naive because it's not something you do in like real production. This is my demo server. So, you know, even if it's compromised, I don't really care because there's not much of important stuff there. If it's wiped, I'll just recreate the Docker containers and it's working again. So not a big deal. Please don't do this on your production servers. This is a bit risky yeah? because the shared runners are shared and you don't know who will compromise your private key and, and you're literally just echoing it into the private runner, uh, the shared runner, of course. The way you normally do it is you have shared run or you have your private runners that actually have this key uh, embedded into them, right? So they already have the permission to access the servers they need to. So you don't need to uh, run all this before script. You can just run your deploy script, whatever it is. So in this case, I'm just using SSH to run the make file there. Uh, we'll get to this in a moment. But um, again, normally you would have something like Unzible or you know any other deployment tool that you might use to actually deploy the thing. But again, this is a very naive way and um, it just shows you how you can do it using a simple shell script and make file, right? Once again, there's all these warnings here um, that tell you, hey, don't really do this. There's men in the middle attacks. It's susceptible to it. And yeah, so you are warned basically. It's just to show you how you can do that. Right, so again, before script it injects our SSH uh, private key from the private variable that I have set in my um, environment. And then the script itself just says, hey, roots at codesign.net and then CD into the folder. So if we go into um, this BB just deploy, you will see that there's a make file here and data, this is actually the database. So make file is uh, something new that I added to this deploy folder. Uh, it has four targets. So the first one actually creates the database uh, because you know we need the database running all the time. It's not something we will uh, really uh, continuously deploy and update. So basically we, we might need to update it, but we don't really need to update it every time we rebuild our client. So that's a good thing. Uh, very straightforward. We just link the volume uh, to current folder uh, data to persist the data. We name it BPVGS uh, minus DB. Uh, in this case, I put it into this code Zen Nginx, uh, Nginx proxy network because you know it needs to see a database to allow it to work. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's it. Then we have deploy target, which is pull clean run. 
very straightforward as well. So pool just pulls our uh, Docker um, images from Docker Hub with tag latest to get the latest ones, whatever was pushed, clean, stops and removes the old running uh, client and server and run, runs the new version. So uh, again, let's go through uh, each of those. So name is clear, I believe. Uh, network, once again, this is done to connect them, to make the containers use the network for Nginx companion because they need to see each other. And if they're not on the same network, they won't do this. Um, I link the um, backends to the database with a database alias. And then I provide the environmental variable that says, hey, database is actually under the DB host name, right? So I provide the virtual host for the Nginx proxy and I provide the let's encrypt host uh, and email for um, the um, pro um, let's encrypt companion. And then I just yeah start the server image. Same goes for the client. So it has different name obviously, but the variables are the same. And in this case, I have to say that, hey, this is the um, API host. Let's see, as you can see, we're using HTTPS. So if I actually copy the, uh, let's, we can start with this. You remember that our API by default said hello world. So as you can see, it's secure, it's HTTPS and API works. And if we go to the, um, sorry, that's the wrong one. So if we go to the client, we will actually see that this is our uh, experts client and works as, as expected. You know, I can I can try to log in and it obviously will uh, throw me an error because th this is a wrong login and password. You can register and all our stuff works fine. So it's, it's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, that's I guess that's it for the um, our naive deployment task. Let's call it this way. Um, it's all automated, by the way. So once I push the uh, changes, it will and all of those build test and release scripts pass. The deployment will actually be executed. Uh, in this case, I uh, restricted it. I said it should be only run a master and plus I restricted it to manual execution. So if you remove that, it will be executed automatically. Why I did this is because I don't really want to uh, deploy it every time uh, to stress my server. As I said, it's like it has a bunch of demos running that I show off to people uh, sometimes. So I don't want to stress it too much by redeploying it. It's not a very powerful server. But, you know, basically in, in case you um, want a continuous deployment automated, you just remove this part and then it works. So, yeah, very straightforward. Right. The next part is uh, you want to easily deploy it locally, right? So you don't want to like run this make file on, or anything. You don't want to pull the images. Maybe you want to build it locally. For this case, we have uh, Docker Compose. So Docker Compose allows you to define uh, one file that describes how to build and link multiple containers. So in this case, um, like I will, I will, I will add a link. Um, to the video description, which will actually point to the Nginx proxy and uh, Let's Encrypt Companion and Docker Compose, obviously. So it's a part of uh, Docker ecosystem and I think it's included with, oh, or maybe it's not included, um, not with all installs maybe, but basically it's really easy to install. Um, it's a very handy tool for uh, testing and deploying uh, complex setups, but there are some caveats applied, but you know, this is a topic for a separate video, I guess. So the idea is very simple. So we have this um, Docker Compose file that says, hey, we have services, we have three of them, we have database, API, and UI. Uh, database should be derived from image or thingDB, and we want this volume slash DB data, as you can see here, here's the actually everything DB uh, database stored in the DB folder here. Uh, in this case, you don't need to provide the um, working year, it will automatically detect it from the location of Compose file. Then in case of API, we say, hey, I don't have an image. So this is the local uh, compose, but build it from the server folder. So it will actually, every time you say Docker compose build, it will go into server, find this Docker file and run the server build, which is a nice way to test local changes, you know. And then we say, okay, environment, here's the database URI. Uh, so by default, Docker Compose puts all of the uh, images into one network, so you don't you don't need to think about the names. Uh, so the names will always be the same as you define for services. Uh, and uh, then I expose ports for server, so because we need to uh, be able to connect to our API. And then the same goes for UI. So build from client folder. Here's the API host, which is localhost 8080, which is actually not required because you know we um, this is the default value, but hey. And then I map uh, local port 80 to port 3000 inside of the container, which will allow me to access API. So, and if I go into, um, we can exit from 
our server. So if I go to deploy now and um, do Docker compose up, as you will see, it will actually uh, create all those three servers. We will see the logs all of all of them. You can see that the uh, database started. We can see that the our backend service has started. The UI is now compiling all the, um, there you go. So UI is now compiled. So basically if I go to the uh, browser now and open a local host, um, we can see that, you know, it actually works. And um, we open network tab and we can one to three, one to three, there you go. So, you know, it works perfectly fine. Um, but if we want to actually test our images, I created a second compose file that uh, uses images here so that you don't have to, you know, do it manually, which is annoying as well. So let me kill that. Um, Docker compose, no, 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 compose, um, minus F. So let me remove the images. So the Docker compose allows you to specify a file um, like this. And again, if I say up, it will be the same, but it will use the our pre-built images instead of the custom built files, right? So very straightforward. Okay, good. Um, I think that is basically it. So I don't really have anything else to tell you about deployment, at least for the what I've done so far. Um, yeah, I think with this, we can conclude the deployment video and actually the whole course as well. So there's what will be one more conclusions video, as I already said, where I will ask you to help me to pick the next topic that you want to see covered on this channel. So um, yeah, please, you know, stay tuned and check out the last video if you're interested in more um, stuff like this, basically. Yeah. Thank you for watching. And I see you in the conclusions video. Bye.